Good morning. Shmati Smriti Rani, the Union Minister for Women and Child Development. My distinguished colleagues, Justice Ravindra Bhatt and Justice Bibi Nagaratna, my other colleagues who are in the audience this morning, Justice Anirudh Bose, Justice Sudan Shudulia, Justice Ram Subramanian, and Justice Rishikesh Roy. Uh, Ms. Cynthia McCaffrey, the country representative of UNICEF India. The distinguished judges of the high courts who are here with us this morning. Judges of the POXO courts, members of the juvenile justice committees, panelists, experts, and everyone present here today. As I was in 2019 when I spoke at that stakeholders consultation, it's an honor this morning for me to be delivering the keynote address of the National Annual Stakeholders Consultation on Child Protection, particularly because the issues surrounding the rights of children are close to my heart. Everything that you're going to discuss over the next day and a half or two days is part of a week's work in the life of a judge. So as it was scanning through the topics for discussion, I said, wait a minute, this is exactly what I've dealt with yesterday, or this is something which I've dealt with just a week ago. So everything that you're going to discuss has so much of contemporary significance to the work which all of us do in different capacities as stakeholders in the system. At the outset, I must congratulate the Supreme Court Committee on Juvenile Justice, headed by Justice Bhatt, for conceptualizing and organizing this conference. The Supreme Court's Committee on Juvenile Justice has spearheaded multiple efforts aimed at protecting minors, including during the COVID-19 pandemic, when it monitored the action being taken to secure the safety of children who were orphaned due to the pandemic. This year's theme for the national consultation is the implementation of the Protection of Children from Sexual Offenses Act of 2012, POCSO, as it is commonly known. 2022 marks the 10th anniversary of POCSO, making this an opportune moment for us to take stock of its implementation. When I heard of the theme for the annual stakeholders consultation, I cannot but be reminded of the words of, the incomparable words of Nelson Mandela on the occasion of the launch of the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund, he said, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. If we are to introspect, there is much in our souls that needs attention. There's much truth to this statement. World over, children are the voiceless victims of physical, emotional, and sexual violence, and India is no exception to this phenomenon. The enactment of the POCSO Act in 2012 was a watershed moment in the history of child rights in India because it finally provided a specialized mechanism for the adjudication of sexual crimes concerning children while prioritizing the best interests of the child. It is gender neutral legislation which provides for in-camera trials, support persons for the child, child-friendly cross-examination practices, and the protection of the identity of the child. The enactment of the POCSO Act, however, is only a first step in a long journey. The families of child victims are immensely hesitant to file a complaint with the police. And so we must be very careful about entrusting excessive powers to the police. The slow pace of the criminal justice system is undoubtedly one of the reasons for this. But other factors play a significant role as well. Issues concerning the sexual abuse of children continue to be plagued by immense stigma. There exists a culture of silence which stems from shame and conceptions of family honor, which we too so often confront in our courts. Two harmful stereotypes con con contribute to entrenching this culture of silence. The first is the stereotype that only the girl child can or is likely to be sexually abused. The second stereotype is that the perpetrator is a stranger. Research has consistently demonstrated both that boys are at equal risk for sexual abuse 
and that the perpetrator is known to the victim in an overwhelming number of cases and maybe an immediate family member, caretaker or neighbor. The sexual abuse of children therefore remains a hidden problem. If the parents of the child do not wish to report the issue, the child is left without a voice and can exercise little agency. But then there are children who have no parental support because they are pretty much left on the streets where they have no protectors. In that sense, the guardian of the child quite literally guards the rights of the child. While the mandatory reporting requirement in the POXO Act is aimed at addressing the issue of underreporting, it is essential to ensure that this does not prevent access to health care. Therefore, in my judgment for the Supreme Court, I recognize this principle in X versus the Principal Secretary Health and Family Welfare Department of the NCT of Delhi, where we ruled that registered medical practitioners need not immediately disclose the name of the minor to the authorities in case where the minor seeks an abortion but does not wish to be involved with the criminal justice process until access to health care is received. Exposure to sexual violence at an early age leads to severe trauma and impairs cognitive development. It has lifelong ramifications and limits the fullness with which the child could have lived his life. Beyond the direct and profound cost to the victims, it affects their communities, disrupts social cohesion, and increases the burden on health, social welfare, and criminal justice systems. The Delhi Commission for the Protection of Child Rights found that there is a high correlation between child rape and dropping out from school. The long-lasting implications of child sexual abuse make it imperative for the state and other stakeholders to create awareness regarding the prevention of child sexual abuse, its timely recognition, and the remedies available in law and otherwise. Children must also be taught the difference between safe touch and unsafe touch. While this was previously couched as the good touch and the bad touch, child rights activists have urged parents and others to use the word safe and unsafe because the word good and bad have moral implications, especially for children, and may prevent them from reporting abuse. The use of professional counseling services must also be encouraged, especially because many parents are unaware that this can help the child deal with trauma. Above all, there is an urgent need to ensure that the so-called honor of the family is not prioritized over the best interests of the child. The state must encourage families to report cases of abuse even where the perpetrator is a family member. It is an unfortunate fact that the manner in which the criminal justice system functions sometimes compounds the victim's trauma. The executive must therefore join hands with the judiciary to prevent this from happening. The research product project conducted by the Center for Child Rights and Juvenile Justice of the National Law University, Delhi, revealed that judges assigned to the POXO courts reported insufficient infrastructure and the low availability of trained support personnel. Many FIRs which were evaluated in the research project invoked the incorrect provisions of the POXO Act, which concerned less serious offenses than the one which was complained of. Finally, compensation of financial assistance was provided in a minority of cases. The revelations of this report suggest an urgent need for all branches of the state to ensure that the police and support personnel are properly trained, that adequate infrastructure is available, and that compensation is disbursed in a timely fashion. To this end, model guidelines for vulnerable witnesses deposition centers were circulated to all the high courts, as directed by the Supreme Court in Smriti Tukaram Badade versus State of Maharashtra. Vulnerable witness deposition centers are in the process of being set up across the country. The installation of these centers is in line with the United Nations guidelines on justice in matters involving child victims and witnesses of crime 2005, which recognizes 
that child sensitive procedures such as th as these centers form a part of the child's right to be protected from hardship during the justicing process as judges we must also remember that children may not have the same vocabulary that adults do and may not be able to discuss the details of abuse in the same way that adults do but this does not mean that they do not know what the perpetrator has done to them children of different ages may express themselves differently but the essence of what they are communicating must be understood especially during the examination in chief and cross examination their contact with the criminal justice system must suit their needs as a vulnerable class of people years ago when i was a judge of the bombay high court we had a report in a daily newspaper which spoke of serious acts of sexual abuse of children who were lodged in children's homes a private children home we appointed a very senior is op officer to investigate and she would come back and report to us periodically and over a conference table because we thought we shouldn't hold these hearings in the formal environment of a courtroom she explained to us how she could draw out the children play with the children talk to them paint with the children take them out into the garden speak to the children over a length of time before the children actually opened out and spoke about the nature of the sexual abuse that they had faced and some of the photographs which she showed us during the course of these hearings were indeed absolutely shocking to us but i do believe therefore that this collaborative partnership between different stakeholders in the process can really take us a long way in alleviating the problem which we perceive technology may also provide to be a useful tool in this endeavor video conferencing facilities from within the courtroom or otherwise can be used to put children at ease while testifying child friendly courts have deployed other mechanisms such as one way mirrors separate entrances for the child and her parents and child friendly waiting rooms it is my hope that every court in the country can someday call itself a child friendly court the ncrb data for 2021 indicates that 53873 cases were registered under the pocso 36% of all crimes against children are therefore covered within the rubric of this 61.9% cases were cases of rape the increase in the pocso courts and in the number of public prosecutors must be matched by specialized training and attendant court infrastructure very often when we have special legislation we increase the number of courts we increase the number of judicial officers but that in itself is not going to be adequate unless particularly an area as sensitive as this we attend to other infrastructural issues including psychological support and counseling and expert care within the precincts of the courtroom i've already spoken about the dangers of revictimization revictimization can take place and does take place at every step of our criminal justice administration it takes place at the stage of investigation that's why i spoke about the dangers of entrusting too great a power to the police to decide as to whether a crime has or has not been committed or whether a cognizable offense should or should not be registered because revictimization can take place at the stage of the investigation itself second revictimization takes place during the course of the trial itself by the kind of procedures which we follow by the kind of practices that we follow in the course of examination or cross examination the victimization takes place in terms of the ambient environment which we create in these trials the victimization takes place in the course of rehabilitation if our rehabilitative techniques are not sufficiently geared to be sensitive revictimization can take place even during the course of rehabilitation and revictimization takes place surely by the nature of the delay itself that is involved in the process 
So we must, looking forward, think about innovative means and move away from conventional methods, of course, consistent with the rule of law. The curricula of schools, of police and the judicial academies have to be evolved and we must have a national model, particularly for the state judicial academies. Child psychology and techniques for communication must be focused upon when we train our own judges and public prosecutors. Finally, I note that one of the topics for the panel discussions today is to do with the judgments of POXO courts in quote unquote romantic cases or cases where consenting adolescents engage in sexual activity. As you are no doubt aware, the POXO Act criminalizes all sexual activity for those under the age of 18, regardless of whether consent is factually present between the two minors in a particular case, because the presumption of the law is that there is no consent, consent in the legal sense below the age of 18. In my time as a judge, I've observed that this category of cases poses difficult questions for judges across the spectrum. There's a growing concern surrounding this issue, which must be considered by the legislature in view of reliable research by experts in adolescent health care. I think I should leave this topic right there because it's something which is very vexed as we see in the courts every day that we deal with these cases. On that note, I would really end my speech this morning. I'm certain that this national consultation will be a success and that all the participants will learn from one another. My grateful thanks to the Ministry of Women and Child Development and to UNICEF for providing their support to the event. And I assure you that the Supreme Court will extend every form of support, uh, whether in terms of our jurisprudence or in terms of our administrative care for ensuring the success of our mission over the next year. Thank you.